All right, we're going to begin chapter four. Chapter four is all about interest rates. Now, I guess I should sort of lead in with a, a five-minute uh, discussion of what we're doing, maybe a three-minute discussion. This is not a course on fixed income. So there's a lot crammed into this chapter that if you haven't had a fixed income course behind you yet, a lot of this stuff is going to be extremely thick and confusing. You'll fight your way through every sentence, you'll, and you'll wonder, well, what does this mean? Chapter 4 in this book, in this course, is really meant to be a refresher on what we've done in fixed income, but introducing a new concept to, to, to uh, interest rates we've calculated before called continuous compounding. And we're going to see how useful continuous compounding is in the pricing of derivatives. Point number one. Point number two, why so much emphasis on interest rates? Why do we pay attention to this now, especially the measurement of interest rates and how we, the different types of rates and how we measure them? It's because the whole concept of the derivative is to either reduce a risk that we have or to take on a specific amount of engineered risk that we can take. Well, we need to be paid for that risk. If there's no risk, then we're okay with the risk-free rate. But ah, what risk-free rate? What do we mean when we say the risk-free rate? So in other words, when, we're, when we have no risk, what is the rate of return we expect to see? Well, that depends on your definition of what risk-free is and what rate we're pointing to. If there is risk, we need to quantify that risk somehow, which I hope you've already uh, taken the statistics course before and you understand uh, uh, standard deviation, variation, are measures of, of risk. But depending on the risk that we have, we need some spread over a benchmark because we have to discount whatever our expected returns are by what we want to be paid for the risk. There is an interest rate in every pricing model that you will use. There is some market rate of return, some spread over some benchmark, some benchmark rate that you refer to in every derivatives contract as the benchmark. So you got to know it. So let's go through, uh, through some of them. Uh, and again, you really, really at this level for this course, you really should have a fixed income course behind you. You really should understand bond pricing already. Uh, you should understand uh, uh, duration and convexity because those are very complex topics we're going to visit later in this chapter. You should have an understanding of, of uh, uh, par yields, forward uh, yields, spot pricing, zid pricing. You should have an understanding of that. This really should be a refresher, uh, a reminder. If you're finding this challenging, don't worry. I can uh, At the end, I'll send you to a, a series of videos that will bring you up to speed on pricing fixed income. So let's start. Interest rates. When we talk about the interest rate, and that's sort of my pet peeve, there is no the interest rate. There are many, many different interest rates depending on what your uh, the context you're talking about and what you're measuring. So let's go through some. Treasury rates. And treasury rates are the rates that uh, uh, um, are on government-issued securities in whatever country you are. So if you're in the U.S., you would look to the U.S. government securities and look at the rates on those. If you're in Japan, you would look at Japanese bonds. If you're in Canada, you would look at Government of Canada bonds. If you're in uh, Great Britain or the U.K., you would look at gilts. On and on. Your own country's bonds are your treasury rates. And they're considered the risk free rate within that particular country. So they, they are a reference rate when we talk about the risk-free rate. They tend to be a reference rate a lot of times for corporate bonds. So corporate bonds will usually quote an equivalent term treasury plus a spread. So if a corporation is issuing a 10-year bond, it will be quoted as the, uh, as the government 10-year plus some spread on issuance, whatever that spread happens to be. And the spread is for the risk of the corporate over the government rate, because the government rate is considered risk-free. So you have the risk-free plus your spread. And there are uh, treasury rates for 30-day, uh, all the way up to 30-year and onwards. So when we talk about risk-free rates or, or treasury rates, what we're talking about is, is the own country's government uh, issuance. LIBOR, this is a, a different animal altogether. 
I've got a thing that says watch this. I'm going to show you a video in a second on uh, on how uh, on the updated version of LIBOR. Uh, so LIBOR has gone through some changes, and if you're um, uh, aware of anything in the finance markets these days, you're aware of all of the LIBOR rigging that has been uncovered over the last seven years. Uh, the trials in the UK, the fines in the UK, they've now come over to the US. So the first US trials on, on, the, on the rigging of the benchmark rate are going to begin. Uh, after seven long years, uh, the, the US is finally going to start trials on this. Since this has happened, uh, the oversight of LIBOR has been taken out of the hands of private banks and is now uh, part of uh, the UK uh, regulator's uh, oversight uh, domain. So uh, let's have a look at what LIBOR is uh, uh, for a few minutes and then we'll come back and, and finish up this screen. So the reference rate is usually tied to some well-established benchmark. LIBOR is perhaps uh, the more common uh, one and if you've been watching the news of the last couple of years, you know there's a huge problem with LIBOR rigging and some people have been charged with rigging the rates. That's just human nature, by the way. If the opportunity is there to do it, it will be done, period. So now, LIBOR is, uh, is under uh, the UK regulator oversight. So now there's oversight to it. Previously, there wasn't. It was the British Bankers Association, that was it. Anytime you have a group of people regulating themselves, there will always be crime. If you're not finding it, it just means you're not looking hard enough. That's it. I mean, that's, it's just that simple. So now it's, there's regulatory oversight. And LIBOR uh, reflects the rate at which unsecured, that's a key word there, unsecured, at which unsecured loans can be obtained between banks in the interbank money market. Why unsecured? Because that tells us what the price of risk is. If it's secured, there's no risk. So we don't know the price of risk. We want to know the price of risk. So it has to be a loan that's unsecured, just based on my reputation. So it's obtained between banks in the interbank money market. Now look at this word. I shouldn't have to give you the definition. We should be able to pull it apart. So let's do that. I'll pull it apart for you. The interbank money market is the market for loans and deposits. between banks, hence the word interbank, right? Market for loans and deposits between banks. That's just between banks, one bank lending to another. That's why it's called an interbank. Between banks for maturities up to one year. Remember now, if something has a maturity that's one year or less, we call it a money market, not a capital market. That's why it's called the interbank money market. So when you see interbank money market, you see that's between banks for loans up to one year. There you go. Isn't that nice? Once you have the vocabulary, you can pull things apart like that. Here's the process. And depending on the book that you're using, it's not updated. As of 2014, 2013, 2014, this has changed. It's now 8 to 16 banks that submit uh, daily rates that they believe that they could borrow at. So sometimes it changes, there might be fewer or more, but 8 to 16 banks will submit daily rates that they, they believe they could borrow at for only 5 currencies, not 10, 5 currencies have been retired now, so they could borrow at for 5 currencies and 7 time periods. It used to be 10 currencies and 15 time periods with no regulation. Now it's five currencies, seven time periods with UK regulatory oversight. You got to be a little bit more honest with how you calculate a rate that so much money is tied to. Uh, I think it's something like uh, um, three hundred and twenty-five trillion dollars of debt is tied to this rate. So the five currencies are the big ones: the euro, uh, the U.S. dollar, uh, the uh, the Swiss franc. I'm, I'm putting the currency ticker down, by the way, uh, the, the pound sterling and the Japanese yen. And the seven time periods are one day, one week, and then one, two, three, six, and 12 months. So that's 35 rates in total. So LIBOR's gone from 150 different rates to 35 rates. So when we talk about LIBOR, it's not one rate, it's actually a family of rates. Five currencies, seven time periods, so there's 35 rates in LIBOR. 
Depending on the currency that you issue your bond in and the length of period between your coupon payments, you'd know which currency and which time period to choose. Now, the highest and lowest 25% of the bids are discarded. The highest and lowest 25% and LIBOR for each of these 50, uh, 35 rates, LIBOR is the mean, the arithmetic mean, of the mid 50% of the bids. Uh, I'm taking some time on this LIBOR thing, more than what's in the book. I've gone outside the book to give you this because you got to know this stuff. This stuff is critically important. If you don't understand LIBOR, uh, so much money is tied to LIBOR, you better know it. Now, there are some alternatives to LIBOR. There's Eurobor, uh, and the basis for that is the Euro. There's TI, TIBOR, uh, the Tokyo Interbank uh, Offered Rate. Uh, that's for the yen. There's CYBOR, which is Singapore, the Singapore Interbank Offered Rate uh, for the Singapore dollar, SGD. Uh, HIBOR, H-I-B-O-R, Hong Kong. Uh, this is for the Hong Kong dollar. And, of course, there's the Mumbai Interbank uh, Offered Rate, uh, and this is for the rupee. So there are alternative alternatives to LIBOR. Now, for all of these... All of these alternatives, we're talking about the same process. The process I just described, this is the same process. However, it's different banks. That's all it is, is just different banks that represent those that are bidding on that particular currency in that particular market.